Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine art the power and the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Welcome to our second podcast in our series on Islam versus Christianity. There are so many things that we have in common with the Islam faith. Things like the fact that God is one and God is just and God rules and God forgives and God has sent prophets and God has sent revelations. But nevertheless, there are some very fundamental differences. And in these podcasts, we're going to be looking at some of those differences. When it comes to the Islamic view of God and the nature of God, there are two major points of difference between Christianity and Islam. The first difference is that of the rejection of the fatherhood of God. The second is the Trinity, which will be our next podcast. But the fatherhood of God is one of the most precious teachings that we have in Christianity. We say the Lord's Prayer and we start it off with our Father who art in heaven. As Christians, we feel this wonderful privilege of being actually able to be so intimate with God that through our faith in Christ and we can have this adoption as sons and daughters of God. I know in my own life that was one of the greatest things that I ever dreamed could happen to me because of the fact that I had a relationship which my father where emotionally he was unable to share his love with me. And so to know and find out when I was 24 years old that there was a God who loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son for me. And he is a father in heaven who I can be in his adopted family. I thought it was the greatest news the world has ever seen. And I just was sure that everyone would want that news. Well, I found out that they didn't. In fact, when it comes to the fatherhood of God, Islam doesn't want that news. We think it's a great thing that we're talking about, and yet to them it actually sounds blasphemous. The Koran says in Surah 112, this is, by the way, what they say in prayer every single day, millions of Muslims around the world. It says, say he is Allah, the one and only, Allah the eternal, absolute, he begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. In Surah 19 and 35 it says, It is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that he should beget a son. Glory be to him. When he determines a matter, he only says to it, Be, and it is. Abdul Yusuf Ali, who is a translator of the Quran, puts this in his footnote with that verse. Begetting a son is a physical act depending on the needs of men's animal nature. Allah, Most High, is independent of all needs, and it is derogatory to him to attribute such an act to him. It is merely a relic of pagan and anthropomorphic materialistic superstitions. In other words, it's just taking us back to the days of the Greek gods like Zeus who uh, became in the form of a man and fathered Hercules. All superstition. In Surah 6 it says, To him Allah is through the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. How can he have a son when he had no concert, consort? He created all things, and he has full knowledge of all things. And then in Surah 2, 116, it says, They say Allah hath begotten a son, glory be to him. Nay, 
To him belongs all that is in the heavens and on the earth. Everything renders worship to him. Again, Yusuf Ali says, It is a derogation from the glory of Allah. In fact, it is blasphemy to say that Allah begets sons like a man or an animal. Yusuf goes on to say, The Christian doctrine is here emphatically repudiated. If words have any meaning, it would mean an attributing to Allah of material nature and of the lower animal functions of sex. So you see, when we think of the fatherhood of God and speak of it, those in the Islamic faith would look at us and say, that's blasphemy to say that God would have a child like he was having sex. Well, <clears throat> we know that there are a lot of verses in the scripture that talk about God in the New Testament as our Heavenly Father, and it's an endearing term. If this is not accepted by is the Islamic faith, then what is their relationship to God? Well, the dominant Quranic and Islamic image of God is that of a master, and their relationship to him is that of a servant to a master. Islam does not allow for any intimacy between humanity and God. Well, I think the one thing that we can all agree on as Christians is this, that we are in uh, agreement with the Koran when it says that God doesn't have physical sex. We do not believe that God has physical sex or ever did have physical sex with anyone. It's just not the, the word uh, of, of God to say that. In fact, um, what we understand uh, about the scriptures is that uh, Jesus was uh, the leader and the example for all of us. Now, we, we also need to understand that there's a radical uh, departure on Jesus' part from the Jewish tradition uh, in the fact that he used the word father. There's a very famous um, a scholar, Jehoiachim Jeremias, who went through and uh, looked through all of the, the text, extant text of Judaism and the Old Testament to try to find out uh, how the word Father, the title Father, was attributed to God. And he found that nowhere uh, was there a place where the normal Jewish person addressed God as Father. In fact, if you were to have one word that would describe the Old Testament that differs from the New Testament, it would be the word access. You see, the Jews and the Old Covenant didn't have the kind of access that we have to God today. They had to go over and visit God, and, and, and he was in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, and they had to go to there to visit their God. But in the New Testament, it's much different. In the New Testament, we have a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, where we're adopted into the family of God. And that's such a wonderful thing. So when Jesus, you know, he appears on the scene, I mean, he was radical in the, in the mind of the Jews in that he would call God his father, okay? In fact, in every single prayer that Jesus uttered, he called God father except for one. And that's when he was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But you see, the father affirmed this relationship with Jesus. He said from heaven in Matthew 3, 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When Jesus was dragged before the, saint, uh, the high priest, he finally just blurted out, I charge you under the oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Matthew 26 and 63. And Jesus said, yes, it is as you say. So you see, Jesus said, I am the Son of God, and God the Father called him Jesus. And the most beautiful words of the golden text of the Bible, John three sixteen: For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the key, the word only begotten. In the Greek, it's monogenes, and it means uh, literally from the uh, English, uh, New Testament Greek English lexicon, number one, pertaining to being the only one of its kind within a specific relationship, pertaining to be the only one of its kind or class, unique in kind. And this is the exact meaning of the word begotten. So you see, Jesus is the only one, uh, according to he, the Hebrews chapter 1, who shared the divine nature of God, and therefore he was the Son of God. And that is opposed to believers like us who are God's sons and daughters by adoption. In Ephesians 1 and 5, it says, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Because we're born again, because John, John 1 and verse uh, 12 and 3 verses 1 through 8, it says, but as many as us as receive him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Here you see that he's not talking about flesh. He's not talking about lust. He's not talking about sex. He's talking about the will of God and the adoption that we have. We are adopted because we obey God in, in being born again. And we're adopted into his family. And, and Christians uh, are adopted by obedience to God. When we obey him, in fact, Christians, we know sin. All of us sin, but we can't be comfortable or content living a life of habitual, ongoing sin. If people are living a life enslaved to sin and they're comfortable in that sin and without the chastisement of God upon them, then we know that they are illegitimate and not sons. According to Hebrews 12 and verse 8, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that this concept of giving us the Holy Spirit, Paul writes of our adoptions by virtue of the work of the Holy Spirit, and he says that we are adopted into the family of God, okay? And in verse 15 of Romans 8, it says, whereby we can call God Abba, Father. Do you know what the Greek word, Arabic word for father translates? Daddy. We can call God Daddy. I don't know about you, but whenever I hear someone to uh, use the phrase daddy in a prayer, I'm, I'm taken back by it. I, 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 I feel uncomfortable with it, calling God daddy. Now, if we as Christians feel uncomfortable calling God daddy, imagine what a Muslim would feel like uh, in his belief that God uh, in the fatherhood of God. In Romans chapter 8, it says, For we are all being led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. To me, that expresses the feeling of both Judaism and Islam in the sense that it's a slavery type relationship with never this assurance and never this intimacy. But he says, we have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifying with our spirits. And if children heirs and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. It is a great great privilege to be sons and daughters of God and this is a privilege that we enjoy and I pray that as we demonstrate that with our lives maybe doctrinally we cannot force anybody to believe anything else through argumentation but when they see that intimacy that we have with God that he is our father then hopefully that will be strong and powerful 
to cause them to really want to find Jesus because it's in Jesus that we have perfect obedience, his obedience, his righteousness, and his relationship with God. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please go to jdkimbro.com and hear more. Thank you.